You're listening to the Sermon Podcast for the Peak Church, located in Apex, North Carolina. Our church is striving to welcome all who are feeling disconnected from God. And so our hope is that over the next several minutes, you will connect with the God that we are talking about, and you'll resonate deeply with the life that this God wants for you. We hope you enjoy. Good morning. Our scripture passage this morning comes from Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. After their release, Peter and John returned to the brothers and sisters and reported everything the chief priests and elders had said. They listened, then lifted their voices in unison to God. Master, you are the one who created the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. You are the one who spoke by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers gathered together as one against the Lord and against his Christ. Indeed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with Gentiles and Israelites, did gather in this city against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and plan had already determined would happen. Now, Lord, take note of their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with complete confidence. Stretch out your hand to bring healing and enable signs and wonders to be performed through the name of Jesus, your holy servant. After they prayed, the place where they were gathered was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking God's word with confidence. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning again, church, and one more time, a happy Mother's Day to all of you who are celebrating this day today. I think it's always a special, here we go, we can do it, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. It's always, um, it's always really, really important, it's always really, really important here in church to not only give thanks, to celebrate those who have mothered us in life, but here at church, it's also really, really important on this day in particular to celebrate those who have mothered us in the faith right? I think it's especially important to, and and right and good, to draw attention to give thanks for mothers in Scripture, like Mary, like Esther, like Sarah, like Priscilla. And you might not know this, but we're here today. We're here today because of the great mothers of church history, the boldness with which they followed and devoted their life to Jesus. I'm thinking of mothers you know, like Mother Teresa. One of my favorite stories about Mother Teresa, one of my favorite legacies about her, is that any time and every time Mother Teresa, she did all of her ministry in Calcutta, but almost every single time she was invited to come speak at an event or receive an award of some sort, she was consistently known for being multiple hours late. Do you want to know why? Because everywhere she went, the moment she got off the plane, the first stop she asked to go was she wanted to visit the homeless and the unsheltered in that community. She wanted to pray for them. She wanted to care for them. And she didn't care who she disappointed or who she kept waiting in the process. I'm thinking of mothers, earlier mothers, like Catherine of Siena. Catherine of Siena is one of our early church mothers of the faith, is responsible for a lot of the contemplative and mystical aspects of Christianity. And one of the stories I love, speaking of boldness, one of the things I love about Catherine of Siena was that when Catherine was young, she felt this call to go into ministry. She felt this call to give her life and ministry to the church. But her parents really wanted her to get married and have kids. And so in protest, she shaved her head so as to not make herself sort of as suitable to the people who were pursuing her. Bold faith. 
I'm thinking of mothers like Susanna Wesley. Those of you who uh, know this uh, know our, our church's heritage. We come from the Methodist denomination. The founder of the Methodist church is John Wesley, but I would argue the mother of Methodism is Susanna Wesley. And there's this story about Susanna, I love this, uh, where uh, in her town, uh, she didn't feel called to be a priest, she didn't feel called to be a pastor, but she did feel called to preach. But her priest would not let her preach. She said, okay, that's fine. And so she hosted house church at her home, and she preached, welcoming well over 200 people in attendance week in and week out, compared to the 20 to 30 people who are hanging out with the priest over at the church. How about that flex? Friends, it is safe to say that our movement wouldn't be where it is today without the bold faith of the mothers of this Christian religion, this Christian spirituality, this Christian, this relationship we have with Jesus. And that just leads really beautifully back to our sermon series for today. You see, if you're just joining us for the very first time here today or tuning in online, Uh, We are engaged in a sermon series, we have been for the last several weeks, called Risky Prayers. Risky Prayers. This is a sermon series whereby we are interrogating all of the things that we ask of God, all the things that we declare to God, and we're asking a really, really hard question of, do we actually mean what we pray, and do we really pray what we mean? Have we thought through? all of the implications and consequences of what we typically ask of God. And so all sermon series long, we've been going through Scripture. We've been finding these moments where the people, these heroes of faith, would make these petitions. They make these requests of God, and then we watch the implications of what it is they just prayed for. Today's no different. Today, uh, what we're going to do, in keeping with the bold women, the bold mothers of the faith, we're also going to look at Acts chapter 4. We're going to look at this moment early in the the church's mission uh, in the book of Acts, in the early days of the early church. We're going to look at this moment where the early disciples came together and they dared to pray this prayer. God, help me to be bold. God, help me to be brave. God, help me to have the courage to do this thing that I'm supposed to do, to be this person I feel called to be. Some of you know what it's like to pray this prayer. You've prayed this in relation to a situation in your job, in your marriage, in a relationship, in parenting, just in life. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to go back to Acts chapter 4, and we're going to pay really close attention to what does it mean to pray that prayer and mean it. Let's jump in. If you have your Bibles with you or uh, if you're at home, you want to hit pause real quick and grab a Bible, you can uh, go ahead and do so. We're going to be camped out in Acts chapter 4 today. And to give you a little bit of context as to uh, what the book of Acts is and where where we are in the biblical story is we are, this story is taking place right after Jesus has died, risen from the dead, and ascended into heaven. Right after that, uh, we learn that the Holy Spirit shows up, and the Holy Spirit shows up and gives birth to the church, gives birth to y'all, brings us together and says, hey, you are called out by God to be God's representatives, to be God's witnesses, to take this news, to take all this beautiful stuff you learned about Jesus, to take it out into the world. And so much like we sang today, he's saying, go, get, get out there and be the church. And so in the early days, Peter and the apostles, all of them are jacked. They're psyched. They're like, this is awesome. This is so much fun. I can't believe they they gave us the keys to this thing. But we're not going to tell them how uh, inept we are. We're just going to go ahead and do it anyway. And so they jump in, and they sort of start this mission, and they're really, really excited. But they learn real fast that not everyone is as excited as they are. And they learn what you know to be true, don't you? That any time and every time God places something on your heart, God is stirring you to action or to be more of something that you haven't been lately, what almost always happens is you encounter resistance. And this resistance can come in one of two directions. It can come internally. Many of you are familiar with these emotions. 
that whenever you feel called to be bold, to be brave, to step out and do something, be something you are supposed to be, you feel anxious, you feel worried, you feel inadequate, you feel imposter syndrome, you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm not doing this. Like, I'm going to crash and burn that thing. I'm going to fumble it seven times. Like, I'm not doing any of that. Or maybe for you, any time and every time you feel called to step out, it's not the internal stuff, it's the external voices that really get to you. Those voices that criticize you for doing what you're doing, that accuse you of different things, who seek to intimidate you. They're intimidated by your boldness, and so they try to suppress it by intimidating you in response. Maybe for you, it's the questioning of your real motives that really get to you, especially people you've grown up with. They know you. They, know, they, they, they helped raise you. And so when you step out to be someone different, to do something different, they go, nah, we know who you are. They try to hold you back to that person, that version of you that they remember. And friends, I'm putting this on the screen for you because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. When God tries to light a fire in you to do something or to be different, to be changed. When these things start happening, oftentimes how we translate these is, oh, I should stop. These are signs I shouldn't be doing this. But what I need you to see is that sometimes these are a sign that you're supposed to keep going. Sometimes these are a sign that you're exactly where you're supposed to be. You're doing exactly what you're supposed to do. You're on pace for becoming exactly who God is calling you to be. Sure, sometimes these are signs that you should stop. But scripture, the story of the early church, what Peter and everybody went through, is a reminder that sometimes God's going to call you to do something, you're going to face resistance, and that's a sign, oh, you're right in the sweet spot. Keep going. And so Peter and these early church followers, they realize they're experiencing all this. This is going through their system. And so they realize, okay, well, if we're going to carry out this mission that the Holy Spirit's entrusted to us, we're going to need boldness. Verse 31, we're going to need to be people who are filled with the Spirit, filled with God's courage so that we can speak, we can live boldly. Now, I tried really hard not to do what I'm about to do. All week long, I searched for a different way. All week long, I searched for a different way to do this. But as I got to thinking about BOLD, B-O-L-D, I got to thinking, huh, I wonder if there is an acronym that we could work with with this. <laughs> and I don't like acronyms. I think they're cheesy. I think they're hokey. I don't like them very much. Speaking of which, here on this Mother's Day, you know who also struggles with acronyms? Moms. You ever texted with your mom and they used an acronym incorrectly or they interpreted an acronym incorrectly? We're going to play a little game today called Mom Texts, okay? This is a little gift to you and to your mothers out there. Uh, these are real-life text threads that have happened with people and their moms and how they did with acronyms. First one looks like this. Hey, I got an A in chemistry. WTF, well done. Don't explain it. Don't explain it. If someone, so one of you moms is over there right now, like, well, I do, I, I, well, that's fun. Is that what it means? Not fantastic? Is that the incorrect sort of thing situation there? That's a parking lot conversation. So y'all have that, like, after church. Here's another one. What does IDK, LY, and TTYL mean? I don't know. Love you. Talk to you later. <laughs> Fine. I'll ask your sister. <laughs> this one's my personal favorite. Your great aunt just passed away, LOL. I thought it meant lots of love, lots of love. I gotta call everyone back. By the way, if you have examples of these, screenshot them and send them to me, please. I would love to have all of them. We can use them next Mother's Day. So again, I have tried every which direction this week to not go this direction. However, as I got to thinking really about Jesus, and as I got to thinking about the boldness 
that Jesus embodied during his life and ministry, I couldn't help but notice that it looked like it required four things. Some might say might fall into these B-O-L-D categories. And here they are. Number one, if you dare, if you dare to pray the really, really risky prayer, God, help me to be bold, help me to be brave in this relationship, in this conversation, in this dream that I'm chasing after. If you dare to pray that prayer, you better be also prepared to have brave conversations. You're going to have to have some brave, awkward, crucial, critical conversations. Jesus did this, and he requires the same of you. Matthew 18, what does Jesus say? If your brother or sister sins against you, go and spout off about it on Facebook. Oh, no, that's not what I said. If your brother or sister sins against you, stew on it for a really, really long time. Don't actually talk to anyone and gossip about them. No, they, but wait, I thought that was, what, what translation is this? Go and correct them when you're alone together. If they listen to you, you will have won them over. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, if you've got conflict and crucial conversations you need to have in your life, be a grown-up and go and have them. We have a rule in our house. We're teaching our kids this. They're in worship today, so they can attest to this. We have a rule in our house that if they've got beef with one another, there's a rule. They're not allowed to talk to me about it until they've at least tried to confront the other sibling about it first. And the older I get, the more I am embarrassingly, embarrassingly realizing how few adults learned this lesson. This is something that actually we're really serious about here at this church amongst our staff team and our leadership team, that we want to have brave, honest, raw, gracious, but brave conversations with one another. And I'll give you an example of one that happened this week, this week. One of our staff people, Julie, uh, had a brave conversation with me this week. And here's why. Here's why. So I have a bad habit sometimes of being really repetitive. I like to repeat things. I like to repeat things. Uh, I really like to make sure that I repeat things so that you hear what I'm saying. And I can honestly say this comes from a good place. It comes from, like, I, I just want to be clear. I don't want, to be, I don't want to, you to misunderstand or misinterpret what I'm saying. And so the way I do that is I say it ten times. And so Julie pulled me aside at one, t- at one point this past week and goes, hey, I just need you to know that sometimes when you repeat yourself a bunch of times, it makes me feel like you either don't trust that I heard you or I'm incapable of doing the thing that you've just talked to me about. And in an instant, her willingness to have a bold, brave conversation with me did three things. Three things. Number one, it helped me be better, a better friend, a better colleague, a better teammate, a better boss. Um, it grew us in our relationship and our trust with one another. And thirdly, and I can't speak for Julie, but I can speak from my own personal experience, the other thing that it did was it helped save her from the dangerous effects of avoidance. You see, friends, if you choose avoidance rather than boldness in your life, almost always you'll suffer from two types of poison, two types of poison. The first one is you just eat the conflict, you eat the thing, you don't actually talk about it, you just bury it, and it eats away at you. And you'll know this is happening because you'll be stewing on it all the time. You'll harbor resentment towards this person. You'll think mean things in their direction. Or, this is another way in which it comes out. It comes out, not necessarily, you didn't necessarily digest it, you kept it right here, and then you just sort of, in your anger, in your frustratedness, you just spit it over undeserving people, innocent people, who just so happen to be in your vicinity in that moment. Your kids, your spouse, coworkers, you name it. And so, if you don't want to be that kind of person, you're going to have to face up to the fact that it's going to take, it's going to require brave conversations. If you want a bold faith, if you want a timid faith or a passive faith, just mail all, you don't need to pay attention. But if you want that, you're going to have to have brave conversations. That's the B. What's the O? Let's keep moving. The O 
If you want to live a bold faith, you're going to pray for that. You're going to ask that of God. You better be prepared to be someone who doesn't just opt for the practical, but also makes room in their life for the things that they're actually passionate about. The RT stands for rather than. So opting for passion rather than practical. And to be very clear, I'm not saying only follow your passions, don't do what is practical, but actually make space for both. Make space for both. I love this story in the gospel. Jesus is touring the uh, area, and he gets welcomed in by these sisters, Mary and Martha. They bring him over a dinner party. And I love this because I can so relate to Martha. So in this moment, Jesus is teaching. They're hosting this dinner party, and Martha is doing the practical thing. She's doing the responsible thing. She's filling up people's drinks. She's making sure everyone has a napkin. She's making sure everything's getting cleaned up. And she gets hacked off because her sister is just over there sitting on the floor like, oh, I just love this Jesus. And she's like, no, this is bull. So she walks up to Jesus and says, you need to tell her to help me. But what does Jesus say? You are worried and distracted by so many things. One thing is necessary. One. And Mary has chosen the better part. And it will not be taken from her. We might retranslate that here in 2023. Jesus, if he was speaking to us, he'd say, gosh, you're always responding to all the emails. You're always obsessed about the to-do list and the chore list. You're always doing the safe When was the last time you actually listened to your heart? I don't think Jesus is saying neglect the practical. But good gracious, at least make space for both. Because, friends, here's what I found to be true. The practical may keep the lights on, but the passionate, the passion-filled, the passion-full things in your life They'll keep your soul alive. Your practical stuff will keep the lights on. They'll keep you moving. They'll keep you sort of in that space. But if you never make space for the things that you're passionate about, the causes that you feel called to get involved in, or the things that bring you joy and make you feel alive, this is where that saying comes from. All work, no play, makes Jack a what? Oh boy, a dull life. Third one is this. If you dare to pray this prayer, God, help me to be bold, help me to be brave, help me to be courageous. You're going to have to have brave conversations. You're going to have to opt for the passion over the practical, and you're also going to have to learn how to love undeserving people. If you want to live a bold life like Jesus, you actually need to be found guilty of hanging out with wrong people. If that accusation's never been made of you, just make it a goal. Say, I'm going to actually start hanging out with people and loving on people, showing grace to people that other people are going to go, dang. And you will be like Jesus. But love, undeserving people. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5. He says this. He says, uh, one of the things, one of the distinctives about my disciples is they don't just love the people that they're supposed to. They love the people that they're not supposed to. That's one of the hallmark signs of my followers. And I love this. He's so clear. He's so clear here. If you only love those who love you, what reward do you have? I almost imagine Jesus saying, if you only love the people who are kind to you, who agree with you, who are like you, who show kindness and love towards you, that doesn't make you any different. That makes you just like everyone else. There's actually nothing, and I mean nothing, inherently Christian about only loving the people who deserve your love or who expect your love. That just makes you a normal human. And this is one of these moments. As a preacher, I tell you all, this job. So sometimes, sometimes I'll be in prep the week leading up to a Sunday And I'll be confronted on an area that if I'm going to preach this with any sort of uh, authenticity, I'm going to have to do the thing that I'm about to talk about. Pesky Jesus. And so here's what happened. Here's what happened. I'm going to give you a little bit of context. I'm going to get fast. Five years ago, five years ago, I received a text from a family member that really wounded me. 
I felt like it was out of line. I felt like they accused me of something that I didn't do and they misrepresented the facts and they did it in a group text setting. Mm, girl. So I confront them about it. This is several years ago. I confront them about it, try to have an honest conversation with them about it, but it was one of those conversations, you've probably been a part of them, where no responsibility was taken. Well, everyone's just entitled to their own opinion, was what I was told. So this person that I used to be really, really close with, there's been this divide for quite some time. And then a week ago, I get a text from this person who notifies me that their spouse uh, is dying in the hospital, and they would like for me to come and to visit and to pray with them. And in that moment, you've got one of two choices. You can treat them how they deserve. You can treat them how the world told you you ought to treat them. You can do the simple math equation. You did wrong, I do wrong back, we're even. The problem is you can't do that and follow Jesus at the same time. That's the bummer. And so friends, if you're going to be one of these people who prays this prayer and means it, means it, you better be prepared to love almost every single opportunity you have to give someone the very thing they don't deserve. Because the last time I checked, that's the only thing that changes people. If you only love the people who are kind to you, they feel like they earned it. They feel like they deserved it. It doesn't change anything. It just preserves the world as it is. And that leads to the last one. If you're not mad at me yet, oh, good Lord, you're going to be mad at me now. So uh, B-O-L-D, you want to live a bold life, you want to have a bold faith, you want to pray, you dare to pray this prayer. If you make the risk of asking this of God, be prepared that you will also have to disappoint somebody at some point graciously. You're going to have to get comfortable real fast learning how to disappoint people Graciously, don't be a jerk, but graciously. Jesus had to learn how to do this. Again, you're following in the footsteps of the very person who had to do this himself. Jesus says this uh, in the Gospels. In Matthew chapter 13, he says this. He says, I go everywhere, and people are really receptive to what I have to say. They love the miracles that I'm performing, but daggum it, when I go back home, ain't nobody want to hear nothing I got to say. And so Jesus had to make a move. He had to say, in order to be faithful to who God has called me to be, I am going to be willing to disappoint my family, my neighbors, all the people who think they know me. I'm going to be willing to disappoint them, to be faithful to me and who God's called me to be. And if you want that for your life, you're going to have to do that too. I got to think about it this way. Uh, there's a good, this is a good imagery, I think, for this. Um, recently, I've been uh, following the writer's strike. Anybody else following writer's strike uh, with, uh, in Hollywood? We're in day 12 of the strike. The writers of all these, all of our favorite shows are on strike because they're not being compensated uh, well, they're not being paid well. And so I'm following the story for selfish reasons because I really don't want Stranger Things to get delayed. But also, the Christian part of me is also like, yes, I want everyone to be compensated fairly, I want there to be equity, I want all those various things. But what happened was the news coverage was showing it the other day, and they put this uh, image uh, on the screen. And one of the things you know about pastors, pastors are weird. Preachers are weird. So people look at this, and norm, the normal person looks at this, and they're like, oh, my gosh, like, look how many people it takes to run a television show. Pastors, when we see these things, we're always looking for analogies. We're always looking for illusions. And so when I saw this, I literally couldn't help but think. I was like, man, I'm preaching on this this weekend. And it's, if, if we imagine like there's a script to a movie, a script to a story, there's also a script for our life and who I'm becoming. And there was a very real question that sort of bubbled up when I was looking at this image. It was this question. Who is writing your life's story? Who's writing the script of who you are and who you're becoming? If you're 
like any one of us, your writer's room <laughs> probably looks like this. Probably looks like this. You've got all kinds of people, all kinds of voices, all kinds of things trying to tell you, no, this is who you are, this is how you act, and this is the life that you're supposed to live. And my question for you today is this. Do you dare to have a faith whereby you are willing to disappoint those voices? I'll go a step further. Is your faith in such a place where if Jesus asked you to, you would ask one of these voices to leave the room entirely? So I'll close here. I'll close here. We've talked about some heavy stuff. We've talked about some really challenging stuff. And so how I'm going to end today is uh, today we're going to kick off a game. Okay? This week we're going to play a game as a church. You ready? Who likes games? Anybody like games? Okay. You might not like this game. So this game um, is Boldness Bingo. Ushers, come. In just a moment, you're going to receive a bingo card. A Boldness Bingo card. You'll notice there are no free spaces, baby. No free spaces. Mass casualties this week. Here we go. Now, as Julie and Amanda are handing these out, look at the screen. Look at the screen. On this card, there are a whole wide range of things that you could do to increase the courage, the boldness, the bravery of your faith. And what I'm going to encourage you not to do is try this week to do all these. That's not your homework. That's not the game. The game is this week, what I want you to do is I want you to find one or two. One or two. One or two that you feel like, man, if I would started doing this kind of thing, my life would be like fundamentally different. My faith would be fundamentally different. My relationships would be wildly different. Better, healthier, faith, more faithful, I might add. So maybe for you, maybe for you, Again, these are the, the spacing was a little bit. So it's B O L D. They're all in sort of like in those realms that we just talked about. So maybe for you, in the B, the brave conversations, maybe for you, the the one of the things you need to focus on is talking to a person who's offended you, someone who's wounded you. Maybe for you, let's go all the way over to the D and let's go uh, down. Maybe for you, so D is disappointing others, disappointing others graciously. Maybe it's you allowing, getting into the habit of allowing distracting emails and texts to go unanswered. I love saying these things to type A people because they're like, mm, I feel itchy. I don't know what it is for you, and I'm not going to prescribe it for you. Your homework this week, the game this week, is I want you to find one or two places where you can mean what you pray when you ask Jesus to help you be more of who God's called you to be. And I want you to do so, and I want you to remember this. Look at me just for a minute. Look up from your card for just a minute. I want you to do so, and I want you to remember this. In the kingdom of God, there is no such thing as brave people and scared people. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as people who have courage and people who don't. The New Testament says this, that if you opt to follow Jesus, there will be a spirit that takes hold of you. And this is not a spirit of fear, but of what? Anybody memorize this verse? Power, love, and self-control. And so, friends, you've already got it in you. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. Thank you for listening to the Peak Podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever podcasts can be found. For more information on how to get connected with our church, please visit us at thepeakchurch.org.